figure out what you meant by going to. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, we're we're multi multi uh, oh god multicasting. What is it? Uh, simulcasting. Oh hi, it's uh, we're we're live, I guess. Um, but whatever, you know, we're kind of informal here, so it, I think the best discussions are kind of the, you know, when we're just having a like a chat. So mm -hmm. uh, um, it's Face the Book TV. I'm Charlotte Pierce, the producer, and I'm here with. A prolific publisher, Tara Alam Alamany. Tara Alamany, yes. Alamany. And she is the publisher of Emerald Lake Books. And we're going to be talking about author publisher communications. So pretty much for this session, from the point of view of the publisher. I'm also a publisher, but I'm not quite as experienced as Tara. So she's going to be our expert at this and I'll, I'll uh, try and move the discussion along. And, and I appreciate our intern, Olivia Doe is in the background there. And uh, hi, Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's flash you up here for a second. Let us just see. She's on her way to Tampa. She's a college student at Syracuse, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. So drive safely and we'll, we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> okay, um, Tara, you had come up with some questions. First of all, tell us a little bit about Emerald Lake Books and how long you've been publishing and what what drives your your mission. Sure. So Emerald Lake Books is a boutique hybrid publisher. We've been around since 2014, so we're getting ready to celebrate our 10 years uh, this later this year. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we work with people who have a, a purpose that they want to achieve in publishing their book. Uh, so in some instances, that's going to be that they're looking to build a brand or a business, and others, it's going to be that they want to set the record straight. Uh, they may want to build a community, all these different things. Um, but we really focus on trying to connect our authors and their books with the ideal readers. And so we go through this whole publish with purpose process that we refer, refer to as a goal-oriented framework to publishing success. Mm -hmm. And a large part of that centers around communications. And so I thought, you know, when, when you asked me for a topic to talk about, I thought, well, since it's such a huge part of what we do as a publisher, but also it's important for authors to kind of look at it and understand what they should anticipate from a publisher. And not all publishers do things the same way we do, but it's okay to ask for information. The way you ask for it is, is what sometimes is not the best. So there's, there's productive ways to do it and there is unproductive ways to do it. And so, you know, let's, let's be productive. You are now muted. <laughs> oh my God. How did that happen? I don't anyway, know. you set that out in the beginning with when you start talking to an author. Like these are the ways we're going to communicate. Yeah, right? you know, they they well, we start actually from the very beginning because if you look go back and look at our website, the very first thing we do before anybody can actually fill out an application with us is when they click the apply now button, they are taken to a page that first tells them who we're looking for, who a good fit is for us, and who we're a good fit for. So we run through some characteristics so that the individual reading it can say, you know, yes, this is me. Yes, this is me. Yes, this is me. If it's not them, then why spend the time filling out our application? You know, so by setting these boundaries in terms of who we're a good fit for and who we're not, if you scroll down further on the page, you'll see mm -hmm. kind of what, you know, who, who we are. We tell them about that. We tell them what to anticipate from us as we go through it. So if you continue to scroll down the page, you'll see it's not until the very bottom of the page where they actually get the button to be able to oh, good. fill out our application. So that we, is go, genius. <laughs> we talk about, you know, we don't offer package pricing, why we don't do that, um, mm -hmm. you know, all these different things. And then if you like what you've read and you're ready to explore working with us, we invite you to mm -hmm. complete our application. So and do you have people that don't scroll all the way down and start asking you about where's your application? We have people who will contact us through the contact form instead of through the apply now button, uh, which, you know, oh. I, I don't know how much more enticing I can make it on the homepage to apply, uh, but they go to contact us instead. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it, no, it's kind of to be expected, I guess, you know. Yes, but it's not as many as you would think. And and oh, so, yeah. you know, it, it's when you, when you have this process laid out this way, it is actually taking them through a very natural flow. 
it's it's answering a lot of their questions. It also points them to a lot of additional resources to ask, you know, get questions answered as well. So for instance, mm -hmm. if they don't understand what hybrid publishing is, we link to where they can find out more information about that. If they don't know the pros and cons of the different publishing models, we link them to an article about that. You know, so there's a lot of different information mm -hmm. there. And then at the bottom as well, in addition to the apply now button, we say, if you have any questions before you fill out the application, contact us. And so we do invite them to do that, but we hope that they've at least been through this page first. Yeah, exactly. And so we, we, so, I mean, your first question on your outline was, um, why is it important to establish good author publisher communications? And I think, you know, like it's kind of obvious, but I've seen so many things go wrong, including in my own dealings with authors, mm -hmm. because I didn't, to be honest, did not think about all this stuff before mm -hmm. I, you know, took them on. I thought, oh, it sounds like a great book, you know, let's just work it out as we go. And that is not, you know, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> well, you have to yeah. think about it from the standpoint of depending on how your contract's set up, most publishing contracts, we're looking for a minimum of three years together. So mm -hmm. would you would you bond, bond your, bind yourself to anybody else without ironing out some of these questions first uh, for, yeah. for three years? You know, so knowing whether or not they prefer texts or emails, being able to share the fact that while I'll take phone calls periodically, it's not my preferred method of communication simply because it may interrupt something else that I'm doing. And mm -hmm. it's much better to, you know, let me know they want to talk and then I'll, I'll get to them. So being able to set these boundaries really mm -hmm. avoids, uh, it sets the expectations and avoids disappointments later on. Yeah. And I find that people or authors you know, they tend to like they have lives, you know, other lives and they, they tend to forget, you know, they, you know, they just. So do you have this like. Regular schedule where you you contact them, is that part of your foundation or what are some of the element, other elements of that? So so part of what we're doing is we do let them know how frequently to expect to hear from us mm -hmm. uh, once we sign a contract with them one of the first things they get is this document we have that outlines the entire process of what we're going to be doing over the next months of working together. And so it gives them an idea of, you know, how long editing might take, how long design will take, when they might hear from us that, you know, for the first period of time when, when we're busy editing, they're not going to hear from us as frequently as they will as we get closer to the release because yeah. we're spending that time editing and getting the book ready. But because we also are committed to coaching our authors so yeah. that they understand how to re, you know, launch their book and release their book, we spend a lot of time front loading the, the coaching program into that time where we're editing uh, so that they are hearing from us consistently, at least once a week, if not a couple of times a week. And sometimes it's with educational information, things that they need to know. Sometimes it's homework assignments we give them. So for instance, we have our authors take the first crack at identifying the BSAC codes to use, because it's like, you know, why they, they know the material really well. And why? let's just tell people what BSAC is. I mean, this is real. It's a really good Good thing to know about if you're an author. So, so these are the the uh, categories and and codes that BSIG has established for books mm -hmm. that says where your book is going to appear on a shelf. And so, typically, when we're identifying what categories a book is going to go in, we our very first step is to go to the BISG website, look at the current headings and categories, and identify the top. Uh, we we do a bunch of. Uh, we do all of the potentials, but then we narrow it down to two to five uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to use in various places. Yeah. And so rather than us doing all of that legwork, we let the author, they know the material well enough. They can go through each of the headings and figure out whether or not this applies. And so yeah. they provide us with that information. We then go, go through it and maybe we only have 20 things to look at instead of the entire list of, you know, BSAC categories. Yeah, that, those can be a little intimidating. I mean, that's, but that's brilliant, you know, if, and it just, it kind of gets them thinking about the publishing process too, mm -hmm. what it, the marketing will involve. And I remember well, one book I had was, uh, we, we did the, the codes wrong or, you know, the categories, we said education because we thought, well, it's something you could use in a school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was, that was, 
it was, you know, for professors and teachers, you know, it was, yes. it's not, you know, mm -hmm. learn well, the that. Thing too is, is that by, by making them part of the process, they're mm -hmm. not sitting there feeling anxious about why they're not hearing from you. So you're right. when you're giving them reasons to interact with you and, and guiding what those interactions should be, it still allows them to pop in other questions, but they don't feel that high anxiety of, you know, I gave my manuscript six weeks ago and I haven't heard, heard from you yet. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> you. And then do you have like, you have, you use Asana, right? This is I use management. Asana for managing our, our projects. Yes. Yep. Okay, but th do the authors get into that? Or the authors do not get into Asana. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, when I'm asking them for information, I am using uh, forms, uh, whether they're Airtable forms or things okay. like that, for them to be able to mm -hmm. fill in. And actually, uh, this year, we are migrating into an entire coaching system that is called UpCoach. And so all of our homework assignments and our training and our materials for our authors have been moved in there. And so with a click of a button, I can assign <laughs> the next homework yeah. assignment. Uh, and they have the educational resource right there that goes along with what I'm asking them to do. Uh, so it's going to make our coaching process easier from a maintenance standpoint while still giving the same value, if not even more, uh, because now they'll be able to see which homework assignments they, they got done and which they didn't. Because right now when we give them a homework assignment, we're sending it to them in the email and it gets lost there, you know. <laughs> The black hole, you know, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. yeah. I started using this program called ClickUp. I've used Asana before too, mm -hmm. but the group I was working with was kind of, it didn't yes, work. I, I, I've explored <laughs> ClickUp. I've explored it. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to do it for myself. You know, mm -hmm. all my stuff is going to be on ClickUp. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's always a, there's always a, you know, learning curve on any of these programs. Yeah, I think it's a matter of figuring out which one works best for mm -hmm. you and the way that you function. Uh, yeah. We've been through a number of them we explored. I mean, initially, when I started out, I was using Trello. And my yeah. partner didn't like Trello. And so we moved to one called Workboard. And um, Workboard mm -hmm. wasn't really doing what we wanted it to. So we moved to Asana. And then we moved to ClickUp. And because my partner liked ClickUp more. And yeah. um, ultimately, I disliked Click up, so we went back to Asana, and, Asana. and uh, that's that's the one we we settled yeah. on. We've been using that for years now. I'm know, actually uh, I, I I use it so much that they have designated me as an Asana ambassador. So I get uh, pre-release. Well, here we go. You should give them this clip. From <laughs> I get pre-release functionality and things like that as well. Right, I have right. A little badge next to my name in my workspace that that's says so I'm cute. an ambassador. I love it. I love it. It's like my daughter with her little dog. He's an ambassador for some dog, you know, clothing line. <laughs> anyway, um, any other ways to keep the author engaged? Is, this, is, is it a huge issue? And how many authors do you have? So we have, um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but about 32 now. Um, okay. We've got 43 books out so far, so mm -hmm. still small, but a lot of our authors come back to us with multiple books. So we have a couple of our authors that we're working on their fourth book right now. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's been nice. Um, yeah, so far as other things, you know, one of the things that we find is anything that we're going to communicate regularly. So oftentimes when you talk to an author about what book they should write, especially if they're using one to build a business um, or, or something mm -hmm. along those lines, you ask them, what questions do you get asked all the time? And that's what you should write about so that you don't have to repeat it all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we take the same approach with our coaching and with our communications with our authors. We have what we refer to as what I refer to as our big book of email templates. And it mm -hmm. has over 90 different templates in it of answering different types of questions. So think of it in terms of an FAQ. Uh, but if I'm getting ready to ask them to do a certain piece of homework, I need to provide them with certain information to be able to do that. And so rather than writing that out every time, I have this book, big book of email templates that's just a mm -hmm. Word document. I go to that homework assignment or that uh, email and grab that. If there are things that need to be personalized for that author, those are highlighted in the template so that I just know I need to look at those spots. And so I look for the yellow highlights. I drop in the ASIN that I need to put in or whatever it is that, that I've highlighted needs to be modified and send it off to the author. So instead of taking 20 minutes or a half hour to write out that email, it takes me all of two or three minutes to get it set up and, and send yeah. it out. Uh, it's like my dad used to say, you know, painting a 
room or something prep is 90% of the job. <laughs> it is. But I tell you, when you when you've got the prep done, done it, everything goes yeah. so much smoother. People yeah. always talk about, you know, I don't know how you get so much done. Well, I, I get so much done because I don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> That's a great. So, so it's interesting when an author asks me a question that I haven't answered before. I will go to the big book of email templates. I will write up a new entry in that big book of email templates, answering that question and then copy it and send that to the author so yeah. that the next time I get asked that question, I've already got it written up. It's ready to go. And we're about halfway through our planned 30 minutes. But um, so if you're, uh, if you're, if you're listening along, we really appreciate you uh, being here live. And uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, YouTube, or LinkedIn, you can actually type a question in the comments and in, in that live stream, and uh, we will answer it for you. Or you can do it afterwards, and we can, we'll uh, hopefully, Tara will be, will be gracious enough to, to um, answer some specific questions. Um, We'd like to know how many authors and how many publishers are listening too. So thank you mm -hmm. for tuning in. Um, so book launch is, is something that you're going through right now, I guess. You have a uh, book going yes. out. <laughs> yeah. I had a book go out yesterday. We have uh, three more that are going out in the next six weeks. So a lot of launch activities going on, which again is one of those reasons that I'm very grateful for our templates because I mm -hmm. basically know from the two weeks prior to a launch through the two weeks after a launch, actually four weeks after a launch, exactly what communications I need to have when. And so I can go ahead and sit down on a day and schedule out all of the communications for the next two months related to this launch so that the user, the, the, the author is getting them at the time they need them and not relying on me to be available at that time to send it out at that time. And so I pre-schedule all of these. But when I'm guiding them on how to prepare for the launch, preparing for the launch begins months earlier. It's all of the homework assignments we give them along the way, like early on, we, we talk about what the difference is between an endorser, a reviewer, and a launch team member. Okay. And we have them start down, sit down and start thinking about who are they going to ask to fulfill each of these roles. And in some instances, you may be able to have one person willing to do all three. But if you want to avoid overburdening a person, you're not going to ask them to do all three. You're going to figure out who's the ideal person to do each one. And so, you know, that's that's part and just one of the many things that we have them sit down and think about. But we do that very early on in the process. We also have an exercise where we talk about, you know, understanding who their ideal reader is and what the ideal reader is looking for. So that as they start crafting blog posts during the launch phase, they're thinking about those questions that the the their ideal reader have. Uh, we have a tool that we use called Author Keywords that's intended for SEO purposes. But mm -hmm. basically what it does is it goes and it checks to see what are the most common questions being asked around a given keyword. And so we produce that list and we give it to our authors and say, start thinking about writing guest articles that answer these questions or blog posts for your website that mm -hmm. answer these questions. Because all of this becomes material for your newsletter and all these different aspects where you can put content out and, and so it helps them not just come up with ideas, but come up with ideas that are SEO rich. So the search engines are going to love that information. So it's going to create more visibility. So there's a lot do, of different it, things. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Are you do fiction and nonfiction? Or just we do fiction and nonfiction, but we really, uh, we do probably 80% nonfiction and 20% and oh, fiction. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if you had a dy dystopian fiction, uh, gay dystopian, <laughs> you would want those things in your keyword, right? In your right. set of keywords. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you would yeah. basically you want to think about uh, in, in this tool, you want to figure out or, or whatever tool you're using for creating these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to think about the keywords that people are going to be looking for related to your topic. Yeah. And that's important for advertising as well as just people searching on Google for these types yep. of books. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Anything um, else uh, about the launch? I mean, I kind of think that's a whole topic. Yeah, it is a whole, a whole topic. From the author's point of view, because I think some authors just, 
you know, they just think that they're going to get the book out there, it's done, and then, you know, we, we, we try and still very. We, we try and instill very early on that marketing is a journey, not a destination. And that once you've finished writing the book, congratulations, yeah. you've finished the easy part. <laughs> um, yeah. Because this is one of those things that we, we make it very clear that your book will be successful as long as you are supporting it. And when you stop supporting it, it's no longer going to be successful. That's just something you need to be aware of. Uh, because unfortunately, these days, books don't sell themselves. There are too many competitors out there, uh, mm -hmm. competing titles. And uh, as much as readers will read lots of books related to the same topic, if they don't know your book exists, they're not going to read yours. Right. So you have to figure out and how you're going to do that. So you have, like, for reviews, you, you need to get that book to them in uh, advanced review copy, mm -hmm. what, two, three months before it's official? For us, or? oftentimes, because we're dealing with with nonfiction for most of our books, it's not nearly that long a lead time. Uh, okay. We typically are doing ARCs um, to, for, for the endorsers, it's about a month before, uh, okay. four to six weeks. And for the reviewers, it's about two to three weeks. And but what we found- might be a little longer. Fiction might be a little longer because oftentimes fiction takes longer to read uh, just because it's usually more word count. Um, but what we found is that if you give reviewers too much lead time, I know. it ends up on a to be read pile as opposed to this yeah. is urgent. I need to do something. Uh, I've got a couple of books that I'm supposed to be reviewing and they're like, I started them and then, you know, Christmas came and yeah, kind of sure. It, it happens and everybody's got a life. And, and so that's one of the things is like for, for NetGalley, we might put it on much earlier than we would, for instance, uh, going to the reviewers that our author mm -hmm. knows and wants to ask to review because those reviewers that the author knows, they're going to, they're going to feel that urgency. Yeah. But only if the author asks them and only if we give them a short window of time. If right. we gave them two months and the author asked them, it's just going to, yeah, I'll get to it. And they never will. So you'll get a much higher uh, percentage of those who follow through if you give them less time. Yeah. Well, for this magical realism novel I'm p publishing in translation um, but from a Ukrainian author, I, you know, I thought Neil Gaiman would be the perfect reviewer or blurber. So I track him down, you know, I, follow him on threads and, or, you know, blue sky, he's on blue sky. He's kind of boycotting Twitter, mm -hmm. but uh, I found him on Twitter first. But he said, I thought we could, you know, you'd be the perfect one. And I, I tried to be really, uh, you know, direct and authentic. And um, he said, yeah, sounds wonderful, but you know, you have to give me the time to read it as well as. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I don't know if I'm going to get Neil Gaiman, but that would be nice. Yeah. That, that's, that's the um, challenge. And, and, you know, when you are, approaching people like that, you need to be aware that they're different. I mean, that they're an endorser. Endorsers, you're going to give more time. You're going to give them the reason yeah. why it's relevant for them to do an endorsement, because then it's not really just about the book and the author. It's about what's in it for them in the sense mm -hmm. that um, will it bring them more business? Will it bring them more readership? Uh, you know, these kind of things. Um, yes. I recently uh, sent out a, a letter to uh, the manager for uh, a musician that we would have loved to have blurb our book. And I spent I spent a couple of hours working on putting together that package, doing research, understanding yeah. what that musician's current focus was, what was important to them, what they were working on in the year mm -hmm. to come, and really trying to make the book relevant to the musician. Uh, unfortunately, I got a response within like an hour of the email being sent out from the manager saying that, you know, as much as it sounded like a wonderful opportunity, there, <laughs> the person did not have the time to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... It's worth trying, but yeah, I, I you know, I, I never, I, I believe in being persistent. So I, I'm not, I'm not giving up hope on Neil. But uh, Neil, if you're listening, <laughs> um, yeah, we have a couple questions. Um, well, do you want to do you want to go through our our kind of? Yeah, well, the one you have on the screen in terms of how you can continue the connection once the book yeah. is released. You know, I think that's that's an important one because most publishers often once the book is out there. Um, mm -hmm. They kind of think I don't need to communicate further beyond royalty statements. Uh, we find ways to continue that com communication yeah. going on. So 
Uh, for instance, we um, have a Facebook group that is just for our authors, and we will post uh, podcast opportunities that we find in there. Uh, oh, nice. We'll post That's things great. like trending topics that we know are relevant to specific authors. Um, we actually... Um, have just joined a group recently that's on podcast guests. Uh, it's a podcast guest community collaboration to be able to kind of, it has both hosts and guests in it. And so we're going there and when on our release date, we will post something about the author and their book in there uh, to try and find, you know, potential podcasts for them to be on. So we're doing yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, we also, you know, do things like um, we just started our first one went out this morning, a, um, an author interview series where we talk about, you know, our, our published with purpose framework, but then we interview an author whose book has been out for a time now. So they've been able to kind of look back on that experience and see how it affected the success of their book. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, you wow, know, that's there. brilliant. Oh, it's only a 15 that's, that's minute. That's a self-rewarding thing. You know, well, you it's a self-rewarding <laughs> thing, but we do it from the point of allowing the author to, to, to go through their origin story and readers yeah. love to hear about origin stories of books. And yeah. so we talk about, you know, what first prompted you to write this book? Uh, who's your ideal reader for it? Uh, what were you hoping to accomplish when, when the book went out? And so by, by doing this, it's allowing us to kind of create case studies for ourselves, but at the same time, it's allowing them to really tell the backstory of the book. You know, like before we go too much, like Connie Taylor, who's uh, tuning in from Alaska, an endorser uh, is uh, often referred to sometimes as a blurber. It's a person who is going to provide some text that is going to go either on the cover or the uh, interior of the book. It'll also go on marketing materials in the website. Uh, but basically, it's somebody with some kind of notoriety, whether it's their name recognition or their position recognition. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's what you're looking for in an endorser. Yeah. So if it's a manager of a musical group, you would put that manager of the Rolling mm -hmm. Stones or whatever you know. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, so yeah, I kind of I was hoping Neil Gaiman would either endorse or review the book, but I realized, you know, like ugh, it's just it's a lot. Yeah, of if he was going to do one or the other, endorser is what you want because that's yeah. the endorser is somebody who is effectively their name recognition is going to help market the book. Yeah, and so if you had somebody like Neil Gaiman, boy, if they had anything to say about the book that would be front and center on everything. Well, he did say it sounds wonderful when I described it. Uh-huh. So if it sounds wonderful, did, did, did you follow up with an arc then, if it sounds wonderful? Well, I don't have the arc yet. I mean, we're still finishing the translation and stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, we had a question about, um, oh, I guess, where have you found the most, well, that's uh, the most success in networking for authors in the industry? I'm not exactly sure what that means, but... Are you referring to um, networking for authors? Are you looking to as a publisher to find authors? Is that what you're? I don't know. Looking for, um, or a place for authors to network. Where or how have you found the most success? I'm not quite sure, but networking is important. <laughs> Networking you know, is important in any industry. Uh, I yeah. will tell you that the author whose book we released yesterday, her name is Ellen Saltonstall, and we did a book called Empowered, Yoga, uh, Empowered Aging. It's everyday yoga practices for bone health, strength, and balance. And mm -hmm. so she went to a uh, dinner party the other night and um, took her postcards with her that we had made up for the book. So she had the postcards to hand out to people as she was yes. meeting them at the dinner party. You know, it's I keep them in my car, you know, mm -hmm. the, the rack cards, you know, and it's I can't tell you the number of times I've just, and I'm the publisher, you know, I'm just, you know, trying to, yeah, trying to work those uh, contacts. But, yep. Yeah. So, uh, when we, before we wrap up, uh, what advice do you have for authors in managing their communication with their publishers? So, this is from the author's point of view, and uh, we might go into this in more in depth in a, in a future episode, but, um, yeah, I, th I think, you know, when you're an author and you're considering working with a publisher or you already have a publisher, um, simply having the conversation about, you know, what's your preferred communication method? How frequently is it OK to write? What should I anticipate mm -hmm. in terms of how soon it's going to be before I hear from you? You know, if you know that your publisher needs, you know, three days to get back to you, then 
writing them every couple of hours isn't going to help. Um, so, you know, having that, establishing that so that you yeah. know what to expect yeah, and, you know, that you can negotiate that. So if three, three days is too long, you can say, you know, especially if you haven't signed with them yet, that may decide that that's not the right publisher for you. But if you're already signed with them, it's like, well, you know, have that conversation of I need to hear from you more frequently because of X. Um, you know, can can we get that three days down to you know one business day or something like that? Yeah. Um, you know, so that you you have those anticipation. Uh, one of the things that we've done as publishers and and my authors, um, when I first started doing this, I thought it was a cop out, <laughs> but I was doing it because it saved me time, and I found out that my authors love that I do it, uh, and that is that when they send me an email. Um, I will often just record a video response. Wow. It takes me much less time to record the video response than it does for me to yeah. write out the email. And it and makes, so when establishes I, a different kind of connection with them. You know, it's, it, and, and they absolutely love it because they, you know, they, they hear my voice. They, yeah. they don't have to interpret the tone of the email. So yeah. it allows for much less miscommunication, yeah. um, you know, and, and I can record the email or an email, a video that takes me a minute to record probably takes me, you know, 10 minutes to write. And uh -huh. so it's quick and easy. But the other thing too, is because I can share my screen, I can, you know, show them what Demo, I'm yeah. referring to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so if they're asking me, you know, one of them asked mm -hmm. me this morning, where do I find the product details on Amazon? And, and so, you know, I went to their listing, I showed them where it was, uh, yeah. rather than writing down, you know, you have to scroll, go to your listing, scroll halfway down the page. It'll be under a heading. You know, in, in, in 20 seconds, I had a video. They had the answer and they could follow along right away. So you write it out first. No, I don't write it out at all. Oh, oh yeah. oh, okay. I, I just, I just, I read their email. I click the record button and I cool. record the response and drop yeah. it in. And, and I, I, in the email, I write, you know, hi, so-and-so here's a response. Here's and I paste it. the video yeah. link and all the best. And that's it. We. Oui. Well, listen. This this has been great. I I'm really grateful for uh, our our live listeners. And Connie says um, great presentation. Thank you. She's thank you, Connie. Nice to hear from you. Small publisher. She's got I know, not as many. Yeah, not as many as you do, but I think um, several dozen books but, or a couple dozen. Uh, anyway, anything else that you'd like to um, to you know throw out there? Any Final thoughts you know, I, I think I think for both, um, I think it's for both the author and the publisher. Uh, always assume good intent. This is something my 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 brother in law says all the time, uh -huh. um, especially when you're relying on email communications or text communications, which are easy to misinterpret. Um, always assume good intent, uh, because when you do that, your response will come across as you know not taking umbrage with something that's been said. Uh, if you don't understand something that's been asked or something that's been said, ask, but ask yeah. politely. Um, recognize that we're all on the same team and what we're playing toward is the success of your book. And so no matter, you know, what's, what's going on, uh, you want to maintain that, that team relationship. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, um, we are going to pull the audio from this and put it on our podcast distribution. The replays will stay on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube on our various destinations. Um, I'm Charlotte Pierce, the producer, and Tara, it's been really wonderful to, to have you here. And let's do more of these. I think, you know, you have a lot of great experience and you put it, you express it very uh, appropriately and succinctly. So thank, thank you, you for that. Um, all of our episodes are available at piercepress.com uh, under face the book tv you just go to pierce press and look, click on podcasts and uh we'll see you next time thank you thanks for having me